The Bastard from Dynasty Forge. Let's have a look at it. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorio. So Dynasty Forge have sent me um, an example of their really rather nice bastard sword. Um, and uh, it is a long sword. So first of all, I'll give you a little look of it actually outside of the scabbard before I go on. Um, first of all, I should say that over the years that I have been doing HEMA and um, collecting weapons of various types, but including obviously medieval swords, there has been a gradual um, progression and improvement in the quality of medieval swords being made that people can, can buy reasonably affordably. Um, and obviously um, one of the benchmarks has been set by um, Albion, um, perhaps also Arms and Armour. And of course, people like Angus Trim have played a very large part in improving people's understanding of what makes a good functional sword in terms of um, so-called blade harmonics, but really it's to do with weight distribution and edge geometry. Now, uh, when I first, in let's say 25 years ago, got interested in this kind of stuff in a, in a physical way of actually being able to get involved, um, the um, replicas on offer for medieval swords were pretty bad and the main reason for that is that medieval swords predominantly at that time were something that were only desired and ordered by people doing reenactment combat. Now the needs of a reenactment sword are very different to an actual sword because first of all it has to be blunt, secondly it has to um, be used in a certain type of way that's quite unlike the requirements for an actual sharp sword. It has to be ding, ding, dinged against edge versus edge in a very kind of bashy way, um, in a way that swords, yeah, sometimes were used historically, but their primary purpose is to be a sharp edged weapon for chopping things. And uh, clearly that is not the same purpose as a reenactment weapon. And so for that reason, a lot of the medieval swords available to us back then were not very, they would tended to be overweight, they tended to be, um, obviously they were blunt, which is fine if you're using it for training, but they tended to be overweight, sometimes poorly balanced, often to compensate for overweight blades, they had overweight pommels, but thankfully we no longer live in those times. Not to say you can't still get those types of poor, poorly weighted, overly weighted um, uh, reenactment swords you can and they're for a different purpose but now we can actually get after 20 years of people um, gradually raising and raising the bar you can get more and more companies are producing medieval swords which are more similar to actual medieval swords now medieval swords weren't very heavy objects they weren't blunt they were sharp they were designed to cut so just like Chinese swords or Japanese swords or um, Persian swords or Indian swords or, or swords from Africa or anywhere else, medieval swords were cut and thrust implements. People watching this channel know all of this, but not everybody out there yet has been converted to this uh, enlightenment. Uh, and the fact is that medieval swords are usually well balanced and weighted for the job at, at hand and their primary goal is to cut through or thrust through things that are like clothing and flesh and things like this. They are not bludgeoning instruments designed to smash against armour. Those are maces and war hammers and things like that. Right, so that's out of the way. What Dynasty Forge have produced here is a really good replica medieval sword. Okay, so it's made of uh, 1060, obviously it's made of modern steel, um, pretty much um, most people are producing uh, things with modern steel because we live in the modern world and that's what's available, but it's made of 1060 carbon steel, okay, which is a not particularly high uh, carbon steel, but it's quite a durable one. Um, it has uh, roughly, I think, a 0.6 um, carbon content, um, so it's not one of the really high, like 1095 carbon steels, which means that it's not hopefully going to be brittle um, and yet it should still retain a pretty good edge unlike medieval steel modern steel it doesn't have lots of slag inclusions so um, it's homogenous steel this it is one piece of homogenous steel I have been sent another sword by Dynasty Forge which is not made out of one steel it's made out of a couple but I will be talking about that in a separate video as you can see uh, this type of blade is a tapered 
Uh, it is sharp, so I'm resting it gently on my hand. It, it is a tapered and pointy style of blade that became particularly popular, I won't say it was invented in, but it became particularly popular in the 14th century um, due to various reasons that it is a subject for, for a different discussion in another video. Um, but it does lead to a blade which is quite nimble at the tip and quite quick and easy to move around because it doesn't have a huge amount of inertia at the tip like something like an earlier maybe Viking era sword or uh, a falchion or a langmess or something like this might have. It's got a slender blade that uh, from there upwards is not dissimilar actually to some so-called military rapiers. Okay, it's a fairly narrow blade up here. The result is it's a quick sword. The total weight of this sword is around three pounds, I think about 1300 grams. Uh, so for a two-handed weapon, bear in mind it obviously has a, a bastard grip, so you can use this as a one-handed sword. If I was riding a horse, I could uh, have a shield or I could ride a horse and I could use this as a one-handed sword. It's not as nimble as a one-handed sword because a one-handed sword is obviously better at being a one-handed sword than a bastard sword is, but it is uh, it means that on foot I can use, and so occasionally on horseback, I can use this two-handed and that is the predominant way that this type of sword is intended to be used. Um, this would very much fit in with the um, treatises, the, the treatises, or some people would say manuals that we study, of the 14th and 15th centuries, so for example, Fiore, Vardi, um, you know, Talhofer, Paulus Cal, Gladiatoria, all of these um, sources that we know and love from the 14th and well, end of the 14th and into the uh, throughout the 15th century. Um, and it is very much, I think, designed with that in mind. It's um, in Oakshot's typology, so Ewart Oakshot created a typology, in other words, a um, codification for the different types of medieval swords. This is known as a Type 16A. So it's a Type 16 blade, which is essentially a tapering blade, which has a fuller in it. Uh, in this case, for most of the length of the blade, some Type 16 uh, fullers only come up to a third or a half of the way up the blade. This one is for about two thirds of the length of the blade and um, it's a compromise cut and thrust blade. Now, let's talk about this specific example. So first of all, let's have a look at the blade. This is um, made by the same people um, in Dynasty Forge. It's made by the same people that they have making their Japanese sword blades. So the finish on this is Excellent. Now, one of my common bugbears or gripes about um, replicas of European swords is that they always have a um, satin polish on them. They always have a satin finish. Now, I don't have anything per se against a satin finish. Some people prefer a satin finish to a mirror finish, and this is a mirror finish. But we do know that lots of original medieval swords had mirror polishes on them. In fact, lots of medieval armor had mirror polish on it. So it always kind of annoys me slightly that the default in the replica world of medieval swords is to put a satin polish on something. Um, because why not, if you're spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars or pounds on a replica sword, why not just spend a little bit more time putting a better quality of finish on it? I kind of think that more people should be doing that with medieval swords and daggers, but there we go. Um, so I am quite a fan of the fact that this is quite a high polish, but I do know that that's not to everyone's taste. If that's not to your taste, remember that it's much easier to reduce the level of polish on something than to increase it. So it would have taken hours on a, a buffing wheel to uh, bring up to this mirror polish. But if you want to reduce that level of polish, you can do it very quickly with a Brillo pad. Um, and I will leave it at that. In terms of the uh, finish, so if we look along the blade, so one thing we want to avoid seeing in a good, uh, good ground, good quality ground blade. Um, so this is forged and then ground. Okay, so it's made traditionally, forged by hand. It's not CNC milled. Um, it's not stamped or anything like that. It is forged by hand and then ground. If we look along the blade, what we want to avoid seeing are ripples like this. So if you look along the flat of the blade, along the cutting edges, and indeed the rippling is very, very minimal. Another thing we want to avoid seeing is an inconsistency or waviness in the fuller. Now the fullers on this are ground in incredibly straightly and again if we look along them with minimal rippling if we look along the uh, length of the blade with the light shining off. 
So in other words, the grinding quality on here is very, very good. And I think Dynasty Forge have done a clever thing by going to a company, uh, a factory that are already producing replica Japanese swords, which it has to be said, I think have been held to a higher critical test in the replica world than European swords have been. And they have uh, got these people making European style blades and Chinese style blades as well, incidentally. And um, I think by doing that, that was quite clever because they've already clearly got a very high level of quality control and a very good level of grinding um, kind of uh, expertise. And they've applied that to a European blade. So what we've got here is a sword that just aesthetically has a high level of polish, a very good level of grinding with minimal uh, rippling and a very straight fuller. But perhaps even more than that, what we've got here which is really good is a blade which observes a lot of the proportions of what we seek from a good replica medieval sword. And that is, and often comes down to, distal taper. Okay, there is another thing we're going to look at as well in a second, which is edge geometry. Okay, but first of all, distal taper. So something that a lot of replica makers get wrong is the blade is not thick enough at the base here and does not taper enough down as we go along the blade to the point. This blade, however, has done it perfectly. It has a more or less linear distal taper starting at about eight millimeters thick at the base. Remember, this is forged not ground from the outset, so it's not CNC milled. So they start with a very thick stock and forge the distal taper in and then finish it off with grinding to bring to a nice finish. So we've got an eight millimeter um, junction between the base of the blade at the fort uh, where it goes into the tang. So where it needs to be strongest and where you want the greatest weight distribution near the hand is eight millimeters thick and then it tapers down all the way down linearly to about there, to about um, three centimeters from the point, at which point it then obviously comes down to a very needle sharp point. So the distal taper on this sword is excellent. Now, we've got, first of all, we've got profile taper this way, then we've got distal taper this way. So in the end result, the whole blade is a bit like a pyramid. We've got all of the mass down here and then it's tapering in both directions all the way down to the point. The result is that it feels really nice and nimble in the hands and feels, I've got to say, to compare to other makers, for those of you who are familiar with other makers, it feels very like uh, comparable swords such as the Albion Cressy, for example. Okay, so the taper is absolutely excellent, the finish is absolutely excellent. Now the edge geometry. So something that we often find with medieval swords is they're almost made as semi-sharps and then they have a secondary bevel added to them. People then often spend their own time apple seeding that secondary bevel to lead to better cutting results. Now, one thing I have to say is obviously my more recent specialism, although I specialized in medieval weapons for the first half of my HEMA career, my more recent specialism is in um, more recent period weapons such as uh, Indo-Persian weapons and um, military swords. And a lot of those do have secondary bevels on them. And indeed, if we look at some medieval swords, some medieval swords and knives have secondary bevels on them. So it's not a simple matter of the fact that a secondary bevel is necessarily bad. The secondary bevel can actually be more robust. And if you're coming into edge to edge contact with not necessarily just other weapons, but even bone or uh, pieces of iron armor and equipment that might be very hard, then a secondary bevel can be an advantage because because it might not be as effective at cutting soft targets necessarily as well. A secondary bevel can be more robust and tougher and therefore keep its edge for longer. So making a sharp edge, you don't want necessarily a razor edge, a, a hollow ground, thin, very fine razor edge on a sword because it might be super sharp for the first cut and then not sharp enough to perform after that because the edge will roll and this kind of stuff. So anybody who's watched Forged in Fire will know that you need different types of edge for different types of tool and for different tasks. But this sword has a relatively robust single bevel. Now that's something in my experience um, relatively uncommon to get from uh, mass producers of good quality replica swords. It is a really good edge and I have to say that out of the scabbard, out of the box, this sword and the other one that came with it have two of the best edges that I've experienced 
from a replica medieval sword. Um, now, I'm not going to name other manufacturers in this particular case, but there are other well-known manufacturers that I have had sharps from that when they turned up were not really quite what I would call sharp. This is, it's not 100% perfect. Personally, I would um, get to this slightly with a, um, with a strop um, just to clean up the edge slightly. It's a little bit, little bit toothy maybe. But what I would compare this to is if you're familiar with medium end, should we say, I won't say high end, but let's say medium end Japanese sharp swords used for uh, test cutting, um, for cutting tatami mats, then this is a very, very similar um, quality and degree of edge to those. And again, I think it's no coincidence that the fact that this sword has been made by the same people that are making replica Japanese swords. And they have put a very good edge on this. I'm very, very impressed. And I could go outside right now, straight out of the scabbard, and I could go outside and start test cutting straight away. Um, so I'm very impressed with every aspect of this blade. Just to come to the hilt, the cross guard is fine. Nothing, uh, there's no looseness or rattling or anything like that in it. Um, I've done some solo training with this. I have not cut with this yet. I'm saving that for another video. Um, but um, so far, if I, if I knock this, there are no, um, there's no significant rattles or anything like that. Um, the, the guard is well shaped, it's well formed, it seems to fit well, it's symmetrical, it sits well against the blade, it's not wonky or anything like that. Great. In terms of the grip, really quite like the grip. Um, the grip is clearly wood core, then cord wrapped, then leather wrapped. One thing I would say is that the um, join of the leather wrap is just a little bit too uh, proud of the leather. So usually you have to thin down the leather where it overlaps so that you end up with a minimal amount of ridge possible. Um, this grip is a little bit, uh, it's got a little bit too much of a ridge for my personal taste. That's number one criticism, minor, but nevertheless, I want to be construction and not just, not just say good things about this. The second thing that I would criticise slightly is the texture of the leather. It is a little bit too smooth and shiny for my personal taste. Not to say that that's necessarily wrong or unhistorical or someone else might love it, but for me personally, I'd prefer leather with a little bit more texture to it. And I actually think that could be achieved by changing the cross section of the cord underneath the leather and just making the ridges a little bit more, have a bit more friction to them. I find this grip a little bit too slippery as it is um, kind of out of, the, out of the box at the moment. There goes the light fitting. Uh, so the grip is very, very nice. It's very, very nicely made. The wood seems uh, solid and hard and everything like that. Um, but the, I'm, I'm not that keen on the, the style of the, um, or the finish rather, of the leather on the top layer. I think it should be a little bit more, have a bit more texture to it or change the, the cross section of the cord and that rib should be removed or made as minimal as possible. That being said, this could easily be changed or refitted by virtue of the fact that this hilt is kept together with a nut. So whilst it looks round and looks somewhat like a peened end of a tang, that is actually a threaded nut that goes down about halfway into the, uh, or maybe about a third of the way into the pommel. And then the end of the tang, so it is a full width tang that is then threaded at the end, and that nut threads onto the end of the tang. Now, I understand that some people aren't fans of threaded tangs. In fact, I have to be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of threaded tangs. Um, that being said, uh, most of the antique European swords behind me here have threaded tangs. So it's certainly historical to the 19th century. And as we know from the famous unscrew and throw the pommel incident, threaded tangs did exist in the 15th century, although they weren't normal. A normal medieval tang runs all the way through here and is then riveted or peened at the end. And this is um, put into compression. In fact, the guard is usually hammered on first uh, and very often the pommel is hammered on and then the grip's put on afterwards. But there are various ways of putting it together. It's not always in compression, at least not as a whole unit. Um, but to come back to the threaded uh, tang end, I think with modern materials, with modern threads, with a modern nut, with modern steel, um, there are less issues with a threaded tang than there would have been historically. 
and we know it was done in the 19th, 18th, 19th centuries. Um, so there are some advantages to it as well. If you want to change any element of the hilt, if you want to change the cross guard, change the grip, fix something that comes loose, then that is fixable. Incidentally, in terms of how to undo or tighten that because it is round, I personally use a set of pliers with a piece of rubber or leather on the inside face. I also have a specially made pair of pliers which have a semicircle, or not quite a semicircle, more like an ellipse uh, cut out of the inside, and you can actually clamp the edges of that. Uh, Marco Dinelli, for example, of Dinelli Armories actually uses a similar solution, similar type of nut. Now, this is again one area, I'm gonna to come to the pommel in a second, never, never neglect the pommel, um, not on this channel, um, but one area of possible constructional comment, again for Dynasty Forge, is that I personally, um, not being the world's biggest fan of nuts, uh, of uh, nuts on the end of tangs anyway, um, but nevertheless accepting that they are historical and sometimes necessary and have some advantages, one thing I have found is that it's advantageous to have an open end to the nut so that if for some reason you want to tighten, 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 the end of the tang is able to protrude through and travel through the nut and you continue tightening down until you've tightened as much as you need to and then you can file or cut off or grind off the end of that tang so it's flush with the nut. Or you can peen it. You can uh, tighten the nut all the way through and when you have a little bit of tang protruding, you can actually peen it and that is what they did with Victorian swords. They had the tang, they tightened the nut all the way through and then they peened the end. So you've tightened it with the nut and you've peened it on the end. That's a very secure way of doing it. The disadvantage of having a closed end nut, which doesn't have anywhere for the tang to travel, is that if you're tightening it and you get to a point where the tang has come to the top of the nut, as you keep tightening, what you're doing is you're trying to tighten the nut impossibly against the thread and you strip the thread off, either off the tang or more likely off the nut because the nut's softer than the tang. So my advice personally would be to have an open end at the end of the nut um, and so that you are able to do that. But I have to say, I haven't had any issues so far with these particular examples that Dynasty Forge have sent through to me. Now the pommel, um, I like the pommel. It is quite um, historically correct for a type 16 sword of the end of the 14th or beginning of the 15th century. Um, the only perhaps um, aesthetic change I would make is that central circle. I think it would look better if, if, if it was a bit recessed. Um, but apart from that, it's fine. It's a wheel pommel, it's a fairly small wheel pommel, and this absolutely could look like a sword straight out of uh, Fiore Delibri's treaties. Um, it's the right kind of size and uh, easy, you know, easy to wear. You could use it in one hand easily enough, um, and it's got the same kind of pommel and similar kind of um, hilt proportions that we see there. I am really, really impressed with this sword so far. Caveat, uh, obviously I have to do some more stuff to it. I want to cut with it. I want to see how it performs in cutting, see if anything comes loose, see if I have any performance issues, so to speak, uh, see how the edge works, um, and also learn a little bit more about the harmonics. Just incidentally, looking at the nodes, uh, I know some people don't care about nodes. Generally speaking, if so if you hold the sword at the top of the grip and give the pommel a bash, we do have a node uh, staying exactly where it should be at the center of percussion. Um, um, down there uh, and that is the correct region that we would be cutting with the blade so the the node up there is in the right place in terms of resonance in the grip my hand stays pretty um, uh, pretty stable uh, so that we've got a node basically where I'm holding uh, my sword down here we don't seem to have any big issues uh, with the node at the back end of the sword either one thing I have to mention as well so in terms of the taper and the distal taper as I mentioned, it's very, very good on this sword, and as a result, this is quite a stiff blade. So if I hold the sword really tight in my right hand and give the pommel a really hard smack, yes, it does move a fair amount, but it's really quite rigid. And um, it's not easy for me to do this because the blade's quite sharp, um, but if, if I try flexing the blade, I have done it with a glove on, this is a really stiff blade, which is exactly what you want from this type of sword. Stiff blades have two big advantages. Number one, uh, they're better for thrusting, obviously. If you're half sorting and trying to jam this through someone's mail or gambeson, having a stiff blade is going to transfer more energy to the target and penetrate more easily, number one. But secondly, 
they're more forgiving in the cut. So one of the reasons, not only, but one of the reasons why many people find katanas easy to cut with is because they're relatively stiff blades, because they're curved, they're thick, and they're short. So they don't flex much. And if you get the edge alignment slightly wrong, a stiff blade is more forgiving and more likely to just cut through anyway than a flexible blade. A flexible blade, if you get it slightly wrong, tends to flex more and whip around. So a stiffer blade is more forgiving in the cut and therefore more consistent in its performance. Right, finally, I'm gonna mention Dynasty Forge's prices for a sword of this quality, I think are really, really competitive, okay? Good prices for a, what so far seems to be a really good high-end product. But what really adds to the, to the value of these things are the scabbards. I mean, the fact that they are giving you a wood-lined leather um, leather wrapped in the traditional way, stitched at the back and with a uh, detailing on it as well. You can see the really nice um, kind of uh, cord underneath the uh, put or um, thong rather, kind of underneath the outer layer and with a metal shape at the end. And it fits, uh, it's got a little kind of integrated um, uh, rain guard as it's sometimes referred to up here. In fact, I think that's more to prevent friction against the clothes with the uh, side of the cross guard, um, but uh, because it wouldn't really protect rain going down. Um, but the fact that they give you a really well fitting wood lined leather covered scabbard that matches the grip of the sword more or less as well. So you get that whole unit and that price. I think that's really, really competitive. The one thing I'll finally say as well before wrapping this up is so one of the big advantages about having the threaded tang as many of you know is that you can dismount the thing and change things and you know I think for some people at this price point um, this sword is going to be uh, even just as a blade to use on a project uh, is going to be quite competitively priced. So Dynasty Forge guys go and check it out um, I won't say this is the perfect long sword or anything like that um, but for the price point uh, or really for any price point, they've produced a really good quality, mass produced, immediately available um, sword here that you can immediately use for test cutting. And I have to say, so based on what I've seen so far, if you're looking for a sharp sword to use for solo training or for cutting practice, check out Dynasty Forge because uh, they seem to be starting to make some really interesting products. And in their European sword range, this is the sword that I think you should perhaps look at the most, the Bastard Sword. So obviously if you do Longsword, um, because it's, I think it's one of their latest releases and they seem to really be listening to feedback and putting it into each new model they bring out. Um, and, and they really seem to have got a lot of things right with this sword. And this is one of the best handling Longswords that I've ever owned. And you guys know that I've owned quite a lot of quite good quality long swords, luckily. So anyway, check them out. Um, and I can only say good things so far. There will be another video looking at cutting with these. And there will be another video looking at the other sword, which is very, very different to this one that they've sent me. Cheers for watching. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.